Turn to Luke 10, the 10th chapter of Luke. We're doing what we do. If you haven't gathered, if you're new with us, why we just, uh, we believe that the Bible uh, is meant to be understood. It's God's message to us, and so we pick up where we left off. Remember the context. We're in Luke. We're chapter 10. This is a big section of Luke, Jesus' life, from 9 to 19, those chapters, where he has set his face resolutely to go to Jerusalem. It wouldn't be fitting for a prophet to die outside of Jerusalem. He came to die. He was born to die. God sent his son, his only son, to die in your place, in my place, and to give us. I'd, this morning, I sat back in the chair on the deck and looked at the deep blue sky and that song, I can't remember the song really, but it's blue skies up above, you know, and it was blue skies, and I was thinking, that's true for eternity. My name is written in heaven. I hope yours is. Jesus came to give life. Verse 25, behold, a certain lawyer stood up and put him to the test. A certain lawyer. Now, this lawyer was not the kind of lawyer we think of, you know, the butt of jokes. You got some good lawyer jokes? <laughs> you know, this guy wasn't uh, an attorney as such. Uh, he was a highly respected religious leader, a legal expert in the law of Moses. So uh, that's who this is. And notice, we don't have to guess his uh, motives. A certain lawyer stood up and put him to the test. He is the opposite of teachable. He comes to Jesus to put him to the test. Boy, there are a lot of people like that. Maybe you. Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Well, that's a great question. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? There is within the heart of man a desire. I know in your heart whether you, you might be one who believes that, well, when you die, you're just dead. But I know deep in your heart, because God put it in your heart, there's a longing for eternity. And the fact of the matter is you and I will be around for eternity. We are created in the image of God. What should I do, he said, that I could inherit eternal life? Jesus responds with two questions. Look at verse 26. He said to him, what is written in the law? How does it read to you? Um, Jesus, this is typical of Jesus. He would often respond with questions. You remember, well, maybe you don't remember, although I, I hope you've been reading Luke, uh, but as you get ahead into Luke 20, they come to him and they they said, by what authority are you doing these things? You know, who gave you, who gave you this authority that came to him? And Jesus said, I'll ask you a question and you tell me. <laughs> he would turn it around on people because he knew their hearts. He knows your heart. He knows my heart. He turned it around, you know, and he said, uh, was, uh, whose, whose authority was John's? Was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? And they, they didn't really care about these things. They got together. They were politicians. <laughs> And they said, well, if we say it's from man, the people will rebel. If we say it's from God, he'll say, why didn't you submit to him? What are we going to do? They come back, we, we don't know. And Jesus said, well, I'm not going to answer your question either. <laughs> I like it. He just is in charge. And so this guy asked him this question, and you remember they, they, I could give you lots of illustrations, but, you know, he said, what about taxes? Remember that one? Should we pay taxes or, you know, what's the deal there? And he said, well, you got a coin in your pocket? Whose inscription is on there? Well, Caesar, George Washington, you know. <laughs> and he said, well, uh, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, but give to God what is God's. <laughs> and 
And they didn't even ask him any questions anymore. Because they were coming always with, uh, maybe not always, but these ones I'm picking out, Jesus knew their motives. So he responds with a couple of questions. What, what, what's written in the Bible? What's written in the law? How does it read to you? I mean, you're the legal expert. You're the lawyer. <laughs> he didn't say all that. But he turned it back to this guy. And the lawyer's response, verse 27, he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Great answer. <laughs> Jesus said to him, verse 28, You've answered correctly. Do this and live. Now, what should our response be to the law? Well, Jesus said, do this and you will live. It seems to me there's a twofold response. Uh, in the Bible, when the law was given, you remember what the people said, Exodus 19? They said, and I quote, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. <laughs> well, you think about that. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. I, I wouldn't argue with that response. I mean, Jesus said to the guy, what, what does the Bible say to you? How does it read? And he said, he said well, he, and he captured what Jesus later and earlier, I mean, I think this was Jesus' teaching in, in a way that the guy got it right, and it was you, the essence. Love God with everything you've got, heart, soul, strength, mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, that's good. That's a good answer. Now do it. And it seems to me that when we hear that, we should say, oh, I should. And the people's response, I'm not going to totally criticize it back in Exodus 19. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. But the whole Bible is a record of what? <laughs> it seems to me immediately we should also acknowledge our inability. Let me ask for a show of hands here. How many of you, since you got up this morning, since you got up this morning, have loved the Lord your God with everything you've got? Don't show me your hands, please. <laughs> this building isn't lightning proof. <laughs> I mean, it's... <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do that. What? I don't think so. And I just asked about today. I didn't ask about Friday or last Tuesday. Well, yeah, but the boss expected me to get that done, and I couldn't. I, I don't. I, Jesus didn't ask for our excuses about our life and our motives and all that stuff. He just said, the Bible says, love God with everything you've got. And the guy, the guy, it seems to me we should have that twofold response. Yes, but oh, I can't. I don't. And the lawyer, he does neither of these responses. Verse 29, wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Notice first, he assumed, he just assumed, yeah, yeah, I got the first one. <laughs> I love God and all that stuff, and all my heart, soul, strength, and mind. What about, what about my neighbor? He assumes he loves God with everything he's got, even while he is testing God in the flesh, right there. What a picture of us and our self-righteousness. Um, was he loving God with every? Of course not. He was testing God. He was trying to trick him. Are you? Am I? Is anyone? And then notice the second part of it. 
he, verse 29, is seeking to justify himself. <laughs> and he said, uh, who is my neighbor? He's looking for a loophole. I guess he is a lawyer, come to think of it. <laughs> he, he says, now this lawyer business, let's do, uh, uh, he didn't say that, he said this neighbor, this neighbor business, that's a complicated, who is my neighbor? Let's go in, let's delve into that. So he's, uh, we know why he did that. The Bible doesn't leave us guessing here. That's one, one thing I like about the Bible. It is the character of God. It is a sharp to it. You're short. It cuts right to the heart of things. Just like Jesus knew his motives, knows my motives, knows your heart, knows every little nuance of why I said it the way I said it, all that stuff. He knows everything. The Bible has a way of telling us what we need to know, huh? And he was seeking to self-justify. He was seeking to justify himself when he said, who is my neighbor after all? And Jesus gives this famous, now, it wasn't when he told it, but it is a very famous story now, and it's a beloved story. Uh, we've got a hospital in town named after this and most cities do. Verse 30, Jesus replied and said, A certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and went off, leaving him half dead. And by chance, a certain priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion and came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. And Jesus' story is simple. It's, it hardly needs my comment. It's so beautiful and profound and teaches a lot. But let me just remind you, this guy that he tells about, he says, a certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. It's about 17 miles today. And it's Jerusalem's up on top, Jericho's down at the bottom. In fact, Jericho is 900 feet below sea level. The Dead Sea is way below sea level. And Jericho's way down there. There's a 3,500-foot elevation change between Jerusalem and Jericho. Very rough terrain. Uh, if you go over there, the tour bus, I remember, it ground down to low gear, just uh, uh, this big diesel. And the switchbacks were just like this, all the way up, it seemed, from Jericho to Jerusalem. And this, in Jesus' day, uh, he's going to be going from Jericho to Jerusalem. He's on his way, and we will see him make that track. A lot of people did, uh, but it's a very dangerous place. A lot of criminals. Uh, you usually tried to travel in groups, but if you had to travel alone, you were exposed to this sort of thing, and this is what happened. This robber beat this guy up, left him half dead, and uh, left him naked. And he's laying there, and... Uh, we have this beautiful account of the despised Samaritan. Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Remember that, John 4? Half-breeds. They've got it wrong religiously, and we just don't have anything to do with them. And this despised one, what a tale of love and mercy. And he felt compassion. He didn't just feel compassion. He acted on it. And if you uh, think of the beauty of this, 
You can't miss the contrast of the ugliness, can you? Of the priest and the Levite that just saw the situation and just got on the other side of the street, so to speak. Uh, you, we shouldn't miss either one, it doesn't seem to me. By the way, the priest and the Levite, Jesus is teaching about the inability of religion to change hearts. That's what we are by nature. I don't want to get involved. Besides, the guy might still be around. Who knows when I might get hurt? Just ignore it. Just get out of here. Look out for number one. And uh, the two religious guys that they would have honored, this lawyer would have been part of their company. That's what they did. The Samaritan felt compassion and acted on it. Well, then Jesus said, uh, which of these three, verse 36, do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? <laughs> well, this neighbor thing. So Jesus tells this story, and he says, now which one of these three do you think? He turns it back to him again. Do you think proved to be the neighbor? And he said, the one who showed mercy toward him. I'll, I'll say. The one who didn't ask the question about who's my neighbor. The one who simply showed mercy. And Jesus, verse 37, said, Go and do the same. And Christ followers, born ones, Christians, born again ones, have been doing the same ever since. Helping, healing, bandaging, pouring out money. What do you spend your money on that for? Oil, wine, life. Uh, on others. Now, this is very familiar, and we've, even if you've never heard it before, the story stands. Let me um, apply it, because, you know, when we read the Bible, we want to know, what's it saying? What does it mean? What does it mean to me? Uh, and we don't want to be forgetful hearers. I mean, Jesus started this out by saying, oh, well, have you read the Bible? What, what do you think the Bible says to this guy? So we want to ask those same questions. And let me just underline a few things because this story has the capacity to be misused. Uh, go and do the same. Do this and live. We hear that word do, and we might just jump on the thought that is contrary to all of what the Bible says that we could somehow be saved by doing. We are not saved by doing. We are not saved by keeping. The Savior and the Scripture make this very clear. What must we do to work the works of God? You remember when they asked him that, John 6? I mean, they piled a lot of doing into one little question. The work. What must he do to work the works of God? And Jesus said, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. I'm quoting John 6, 29 and and 30 or 28 and 29, I can't remember right in there. You'll find it. Jesus was very clear on that. We're not saved by doing The Scripture is very clear. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not as a result of works that anyone would boast. When we come around this table, we're not celebrating what we've done or what we're doing. And the Bible says all throughout, I quoted from Titus last week, because he says, I want you to be clear on this, Titus. We are not saved. He saved us not according to our works, but according to his own mercy and grace. And he renewed us by the refreshing ministry of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to speak confidently about that so that those who have been justified may be careful to engage in good deeds. That that's always the order. 
of the Scripture. So don't take this and say that we are saved by doing uh, or that we are saved by keeping the Bible and the Savior. Make that very clear. We are saved by His grace. He is the one who did, and we celebrate today, and He told us to what He did, not what we do. Secondly, let me just underline that inheritance, you know, the guy came and said, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Inherit is normally not by doing, but by what? (laughs) Birth. Birth. And uh, when you're born again through faith in Jesus Christ, when you come and confess your sin and acknowledge that I can't even love you with all my heart, soul, strength, and mind, the very first commandment puts me in that category of lost. Even if I just judged by since I got up this morning, if I'm honest, and if I don't, we all understood what I said when I asked that this building isn't lightning proof. When we stop and think. So when we confess our sin and say, Lord, I don't even love you like I should. In fact, my lifestyle makes me think I hate you at times. In fact, I know what I'm made of. And we confess our sin and we're born again. Then he comes in and changes us from the inside out. And we do the work of the gospel. We do good deeds. We engage in good deeds. And uh, it's not because people are looking necessarily. It's not because we're seeking to earned favor with God, that's for sure. When a Kendrick Lau and Alicia, when they go over to Niger and pour out their life and their time and their money, do you think they do it because a medical doctor couldn't do better here in the States? Of course not. Of course not. When uh, Robbie invests her life in Russia, is it because there's, it's a safe place? Go ride the subways over there in Moscow. Get into the dark places in Moscow as a single gal, and, and you know, why, why does she do that? Because she's been changed from the inside out. She's come to know Jesus Christ, and she's living it out. When Dan and Roberta, when Eric and Amber, I mean, I could just multiply the names, Randy and Emily, Rod and Margie, Door to Grace volunteers. Do they do that for the money? Do they do that because it's the safe thing to do to help those gals to reach out and to touch and minister and pour money and oil and wine, so to speak, on hurting ones? No. When people selflessly teach Sunday school and see kids not listen and week after week, quarter after quarter, year after year, some of you have plowed a lot of time and there's times when you get discouraged. You're not doing it because people give you a lot of credit. (laughs) No, God changes us from the inside out and inheritance is by birth. And when you're born again, you're a new creature in Christ. And uh, I think we should see that here as we hear what Jesus said to this religionist. And then let me just say, it's hard to read this. It's very hard to read this and not see the gospel illustrated. Look at verse 30. This guy had been beaten by a robber, stripped him, and left him half dead. A helpless, half dead sinner. Sin destroys. The Satan de- steals, he kills, he destroys. And that's the condition man has been left in by our sin. Helpless. Laying there on the, half dead on the side of the road, this guy is. And the priest comes along, and he just says, ooh, and gets on the other side. The Levite comes along and goes on the other side. I repeat it. You can, people tell me, oh, I go to church every week, or I never miss Holy Communion, or I've been through catechism. I, you can go to all the ceremonies. You can never miss ceremonies. You can... Memorize lots of law 
and do your best to kind of keep it by your own standards of doing your best. You can be a priest or a Levite, and uh, ceremonies, laws, religion really don't change the inner man. Okay? And then this despised one, Samaritan. Who is that despised one? Well, who is the despised one? The Lord Jesus Christ. Rejected by men, but choice and precious in the sight of God. 1 Peter 2, verse 4. I remember in college, that verse gripped me, and I put it on a, I had a little shelf, I built this desk that had a shelf looking right at me, a quarter inch plywood, and I just wrote on a quarter inch piece of tape, rejected by men, but choice and precious in the sight of God, and every time I'd look up for several months, that's what I saw, the despised one, the despised one. A man of sorrow is acquainted with grief, like one from whom men hide their face. We did not esteem him. The despised one came, and notice, look at verse 33, felt compassion. I think I said the other day, because I checked it out earlier in Luke, uh, this word is used almost exclusively of our Lord Jesus. And I mentioned this one at the time. This is one of the, one of the exceptions in this guy pictures. The Savior, he felt compassion. He didn't just feel it. The gospel isn't sentimentality. He felt compassion and he acted on it. He healed, he bandaged, and notice, he put him, he put the helpless, half-dead, naked one in his place. He put him on his own beast and he took his place, and he brought him to an inn and took care of him. You know, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus Christ took our place and put us in his place, the great exchange. And then he said, listen, here's some money, and if it takes anything more, just charge it to my account. It's paid in full. Praise God. We have that kind of a Savior. And when we celebrate, we don't celebrate our religious doings. We celebrate. And it is finished. It is completely paid for. Salvation and Savior. And then we go out commissioned to live like he did. To give, to heal, to pour ourselves out, to invest, to pour our money out, to pour our time, to pour our energy on hurting ones. And show the compassion of Christ to a world that desperately needs it rather than seeking to split hairs about who my neighbor is. I'll tell you, that's what Jesus taught here. And it's very, very clear.